Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. And thank you for joining us today on uh, what is apparently a quite threatening day. And so we're thrilled that you have come out uh, to brave the weather with us and uh, welcome Dean Nance. Uh, before we get started, I do want to thank uh, the UA Engage team for making this uh, and the events of the day happen, uh, especially Lenny Ramsey, Deanna Casante, and the fabulous Jeanette Bird, uh, who has orchestrated and organized all of these events for us. I'm Shauna Morimoto, and I am the PI on the University of Arkansas's NSF Advance Grant, uh, which seeks gender equity and intersectional equity for uh, women and women of color at the University of Arkansas, uh, particularly focused on STEM fields, but across campus overall. As part of our grant, we like to welcome a keynote speaker annually, and this year we are thrilled to have Cynthia Nance, Nance as our guest. Uh, Cindy Nance is Dean and Nathan G. Gordon Professor at the University of Arkansas School of Law. She's a graduate with distinction from the University of Iowa College of Law, where she also earned an MA from the Business College. Since joining the law faculty as an assistant professor in 1994, Dean Nance has served in numerous roles, including as dean from 2006 to 2011, and as the law school's first director of pro bono and community engagement. She publishes and practices in the areas of labor and employment law and workplace legislation. She is an internationally renowned scholar and is widely published in these areas of law in, in numerous journals, including the Iowa Law Review, Berkeley Journal of Employment and Labor Law, and Rutgers Law Review. Her many awards for outstanding service include the 2023 Association of American Law Schools Ruth Bader Ginsburg Lifetime Achievement Award and the 2023 Lawyers of Color Power List. She is a recipient of the Northwest Arkansas Martin Luther King Commission, in Commission Individual Achievement Award and was recognized as one of Diverse Issues in Higher Education Magazine's 25 Women Making a Difference. Uh, we are absolutely thrilled to have her with us today talking about quiet leadership and the roles that we all play as leaders and mentors for women and other faculty in our midst. So welcome, Dean Nance. a long ways. <laughs> I was saying earlier, maybe we should just skip the speech and have a dance party. <laughs> but yeah, no, that wasn't the, wasn't the plan. So thank you very much for coming out today on this, as uh, has been mentioned, threatening day. I want to thank our hosts, uh, the UA Engage team, for the invitation to speak to you today as part of the inspiring and influential speaker series. Now I have to say that gave me a little bit of pause because that's a big lift to be both inspiring and influential, but I'll give it my best. Um, special thanks to Jeanette Bird, who has been my gracious point of contact in preparing for today. Uh, a bit of background about the UA Engage program for those of you who may not be familiar with it. Uh, UA Engage is Empowering Network Groups for Arkansas Gender Equity. It is funded by a $1 million NSF grant. Uh, and the idea is to better recruit and retain women and women of color within STEM departments. The overarching goal, though, of UA Engage is institutional transformation. By adopting policies and practices to support underrepresented groups and mitigating organizational barriers, UA Engage hopes to make a positive difference for our faculty and the university. It targets gender and racial equity among faculty by focusing on valuing and integrating women faculty 
while also enhancing efforts to recruit diverse faculty. So I know we do have some guests here today, and I thought it was, oh, sorry, I forgot to advance my slide. It was important to let you know a little bit about our sponsors for today. Again, thank you to the, for the invitation to speak and for the opportunity to advance the goals of the UA Engage program. Okay, I'll, I'm gonna keep up this time. So my roadmap, and by the way, this is updated for uh, this generation because I actually have an atlas, the paper map. Um, but I thought if I put that up there, you wouldn't know what that was. So my roadmap is uh, where I'm gonna go in my talk, and that is um, I'm gonna talk about quiet leadership. I wanna talk about women as quiet leaders, intersectionality and in quiet leadership, and I'm going to introduce you to a few quiet leaders. Those of us who have been around for a while always hear the same names, not that these women are not transformational, but I thought it was important, given the goals of the Engage Project, to introduce you to amazing, diverse women who you may not have heard of because they're what? Quiet leaders. All right. So let me start with framing quiet leadership. In thinking about what I would share in light of the Engage Program's goals, I was struck with this notion of quiet leadership including that of the team of women who helped to administer this program and create opportunities for other women and underrepresented individuals. In thinking about this topic, I borrowed heavily from Eric Seeger's ordinary leadership, but I reframe it as quiet leadership because I believe by virtue of being a leader, one is more than ordinary. Now, quiet leaders are not usually the larger than life figures. They move patiently, carefully, prudently, and inconspicuously behind the scenes. They don't need to get the credit. They just want to do the right thing. They help solve big problems by a series of small, deliberate efforts. I'm sure many of you here today can identify with this and think of leaders who fit this description. Having said that, all leaders are capable of engaging in quiet leadership. In recent years, there have been many memorable examples of quiet leadership in public spaces. Here are a few that came to mind for me in thinking about this. This is the then 37-year-old Prime Minister of New Zealand, who after a mass shooting at a mosque, visited members of the refugee and Muslim community the next day, the next day, dressed in black and wearing a hijab, comforting survivors and telling them that the whole country was united with them in grief. Quiet leadership. We also watch the treatment of Justice Brown Jackson as she went through the confirmation process with grace and dignity even while being excoriated and disrespected. Her silent tears as Senator Booker saw her were shared and felt by women around the world. I did cry with her that day. Quiet leadership. We witnessed the quiet leadership of former President Barack Obama when he spontaneously began singing Amazing Grace at the service for those gathered to mourn the loss of life at Mother Emanuel AME Church in South Carolina. Now, in thinking about this type of leader, I am reminded of the quote of journalist Ellen Welleroth, who reminds us that sometimes just being yourself is the radical act. When you occupy space in systems that weren't built for you, 
<laughs> your authenticity is activism. I'm sure that many, if not every woman in this room has experienced that feeling. This is a picture of the Supreme Court in 1988 with Justice Thurgood Marshall, radical authenticity as activism, and Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Justice O'Connor, as a side note, the first woman on the Supreme Court came to Arkansas to help us dedicate the, addition, uh, the new addition to the law school. By the way, if I may digress for a moment, Justice O'Connor's visit was facilitated by the quiet leadership of two dean friends who had both clerked for her. They told her it was important for her to come to this place at that time and to recognize both our history and our progress. And she did that because of their quiet leadership. Let me tell, tell two stories from my own experience that reflect the radical act of identity. Those who know me know there are many, many stories. Um, soon after I arrived on campus, Dr. Margaret Clark, who is here this evening, reached out to me and befriended me as a junior non-tenured professor. She said to me, publishing is the name of the game. Let's sit down and write something together. Quiet leadership. Well, we were there on a Saturday afternoon working on an interdisciplinary piece when one of my colleagues, no longer here, so not, not in the audience today, one of my colleagues um, knocked on the door and asked us what we were doing. Now, for some reason, the vision of two women of color quietly writing together prompted a tirade. He went into detail about how the academy is unfair because it favors even mediocre people of color like me over white guys. And that was the reason he could not move to another institution because of people like me. Well, I had a lot of reactions to that. The first one is I wasn't trying to go to another institution, so it really wasn't me. Um, the other thing though is I felt embarrassed and humiliated that my friend and colleague Margaret had to witness this behavior. But my favorite part of the story is that the entire time he was speaking, Dr. Margaret Clark looked at him and when he left, she said, hmm, what's his problem? <laughs> and then she said, the way to prove him wrong is to get this piece done. And we went back to work. During my first deanship, I, I also, I attended a conference of law deans in Miami. At that time, there were three black women law deans. There are now 28, and it makes my heart full. During the two and a half day conference, each of us had a speaking role. The day after the conference, I had another day of meetings on the club floor of the hotel to help interview candidates for the Law School Admission Council presidency. Having the interviews in the conference hotel was a way for the deans who were interviewing to do so discreetly. Before the meeting, members of the search committee went into the club room to get breakfast. I was dressed in a navy blue suit with pearls and pumps. A fellow woman dean approached me and in a loud voice said, Will you please get me some wheat bread for my toast? Now I have to admit something to you. Many times, even now, I have the Cindy Nance answer and the Dean Nance answer. 
and I need to take a moment to filter before responding. I'm sure you can imagine what the former would have began, been. I began with, no ma'am. But before I could finish, my colleague intervened, and let's just say she suggested that that dean find her own bread. Now, you would think that would be the end of the story. But later, that same dean called me at my office to say that her partner was a psychologist. And if I ever needed help, I should reach out. Y'all, I don't have to make stories up. I have also been asked to validate parking. And at the Southern Law Dean's meeting, the host in Jackson, Mississippi, we were in a Jackson club, assumed I was one of my colleagues' partners rather than a fellow dean. In each instance, I have been professionally attired and the only person of color. So yes, sometimes, sometimes just being present is a radical act of identity. Now let's tease out a little bit more what I mean when I refer to quiet leaders. Harvard Business Review defined quiet leaders as those who apply modesty, restraint, and tenacity to solve particularly difficult problems. A leadership researcher described quiet leaders this way. Sometimes a few people are aware of what they do. Sometimes nobody's aware. There aren't medal ceremonies, and often the people involved don't think they deserve one, even if medals were being given out. But often, they're people who find some situation or problem or difficulty affecting a person or an organization, and it bothers them. It gets under their skin. Other people say, eh, why are you worrying about this? They care. They commit themselves and they keep working tenaciously so that over a period of time, they find ways to get things done. In my experience, these things that quiet leaders worry about often are how to make things better for others, how to make systems work better, to see individuals for who they are, and to lift and empower them. This describes so many of the women leaders I know, and many of you are here in the room today, and I've benefited from your grace and guidance. By being here, you lift and support me, even as my task today is to inspire you. Now, we can all think of examples of programs and initiatives that were started based on the interest and drive of a quiet leader who saw a problem and with, I'm getting behind on my slides, y'all, and with little fanfare, set out to make a difference. It's how we got the ECAP program, the Engage program, the Gerhardt Pantry, the Little Free Pantry started by Jessica McClard of Good Shepherd Lutheran that has spread around the world, the Magdalene House, the Women's Circle, the Spark program, pre-law program, the Law School Legal Clinic, started by Hillary Clinton, Single Parent Scholarship Program, and the list goes on. So let's talk about women as quiet leaders. Researching these remarks, I was reminded of a Harvard Business Review study that I use in my leadership class that evaluates and compares the leadership capabilities of when versus men versus women and you can see the, some of the data on the slide in front of you. I find this data not only interesting because women are rated higher on so many dimensions of leadership, but also because I have a hunch that the lower rating on the two categories, technical or professional expertise, 
and developing strategic perspective are likely due to the same implicit bias that makes navigating a STEM career so difficult. There's some support for my hunch. In the 2022 report of the Arkansas Women's Commission, which found that cultural barriers continue to result in girls and women being stereotyped and even counseled into non-STEM careers. Men remain the norm in those jobs, in education settings and in the media. The report goes on to state that in higher grades, STEM area teachers are often predominantly male. When women do decide to pursue a career in STEM, they report sexism at both the college level and in the workplace. I have a friend who is not in my remarks, but thinking about this, who talked about going through uh, the engineering program and a professor would put his finger in the blouse of women and look down it. I, can't, I just can't fathom that. Even after completing a degree in STEM, women continue to face barriers to success. Exclusion, harassment, lack of mentorship, few role models, and parental leave issues. Women of color, intersectionality. Women of color encounter racism as well as sexism in the predominantly male and white STEM fields. They come to view themselves as outsiders. This is all language, 2022 Commission on Women in Arkansas. So this may explain why the authors of the Harvest, Harvard Business Review study also found that when women were asked to assess themselves, they were not as generous in their ratings of themselves. The difference was most striking when comparing the confidence ratings for men and women under the age of 25. In the, word of, in the words of the authors, it is highly probable that those women are far more competent than they think, while the male leaders are overconfident and assuming that they are more confident, competent than they are. Fortunately, data suggests that as women get get older, the gap lessens, and in fact, when we get to age 60 and above, women are more confident than their male peers, according to researchers. But what potential is squandered in the meantime? It stands to reason that women gain more confidence with age. I believe it's due to the fact that it took so long for women leaders to get where they are. Over time, Women are reassured of their competency, especially as leaders, because of their performance and gained experience. So then, quiet leadership is not only a style of leading, but without intentionality, it can mean that the leadership of women is overlooked. You've all heard the example of when there is a job opening for which a man meets 60% of the qualifications and he feels, I can learn the rest of that stuff. While a woman looks at the same qualifications and says, oh, I don't meet all those, so I better not apply. When women don't act, when we hesitate because of uncertainty, we hold ourselves back and we lose those leadership opportunities. Similarly, when men do not promote and sponsor women and encourage them, to reach their full potential, those leadership opportunities are lost. So that is why programs like Engage are so important, because confidence, the belief in one's ability to succeed, encourages and stimulates action. It's like a cycle. These actions, in turn, can bolster one's belief in one's ability to succeed, and the confidence snowballs and accumulates. Truly adopting policies and practices to support underrepresented groups that those policies that mitigate organizational barriers, along with providing mentorship and encouragement, allows women and people of color 
to more readily take chances and to engage leadership opportunities. I think it's important, uh, these are some quotes from Beyonce and Simone Biles. So I know we have young people here, so I wanted to quote some young people for you. And I think these quotes reflect why the UA Women's Leadership Exploration Program is so important. It works to increase the engagement of female faculty in leadership roles across our campus colleges. If you've been questioning next steps and how to best develop and engage your leadership skills, I know Dee Needy is here today, and I encourage you to speak with her and to check it out. Now, as I mentioned, um, the experience for women and people of color, this is the cover from the 2022 uh, Arkansas um, report on women. As I mentioned above, the experience for women and people of color in STEM is often much more difficult. In the recommendations of the Arkansas Commission on Women, they clearly spoke to these issues in recommending increased mentorship and increased equity in STEM education. I'd like to very briefly highlight the issue of intersectionality. With appreciation for the path-breaking work of Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, I'd like to suggest that we take an expanded view of intersectionality, one which includes not only race and sex, but also occupation or field. The intersection of these demographic variables with the male-oriented culture of STEM lies at the heart of many of the challenges women in these fields face. At its very worst, this is reflected in a 2023 study featured in diverse issues of higher education, very timely as we observe Sexual Assault Awareness Month. The Georgia State University study found that college women majoring in STEM fields more frequently experience sexual assault than those not in STEM. According to the study, women in gender balanced STEM fields, chemistry, math, and biology reported the most sexual violence, nearly three times more than in non-gender balanced STEM fields and more than in predominantly male STEM disciplines, engineering, physics, and computer science. The study's authors suggest that the findings are consistent with a backlash effect, where improvements in gender equality are related to increased violence against women. And many of you are aware of the data on women of color in STEM. After decades of work and sacrifice to open doors for women of color in STEM fields, differential participation persists. Disparities in level of achievement continue and career in science still exacts a heavy professional and personal toll. This quote is from a chancellor and three vice presidents in higher education. Why is it important for a talk on quiet leadership to mention intersectionality? because there are many leaders in these fields who are doing the quiet leadership work, mentoring, sponsoring, and coaching, and encouraging women in STEM. They are writing the grants, developing the programs, challenging the policies, and creating greater access and opportunity. They are not only occupying spaces not meant for them, but they are addressing the situations and difficulties that are affecting women at the intersection, affecting an organization, affecting processes. While colleagues may say, hey, why are you worried about it? They care. They commit themselves and keep working tenaciously so that over a period of time, they find ways to make change. It is important to have these quiet leaders 
in the spaces in which women at the intersection find themselves. Well, I've talked about quiet leadership, women as quiet leaders, and intersectionality in quiet leadership. But before I introduce you to a few amazing leaders, I want to be quiet leaders. I want to be clear about a few points. I do not mean to imply in my talk today that all women must be quiet leaders. And if you know me, you know that is a fact. My point is that there is a lot of leading that is done quietly and not recognized. And in my view, often underappreciated. Nor do I mean to imply that only women are quiet leaders. As I hope my quick example of former President Obama, who, by the way, was much criticized for his quiet leadership style. Say something, speak up, do something. I also do not suggest that all, uh, that in my view, all the misnamed soft skills, I think that is a, I think that's a sexist term, but are attributable and should be expected from women. My point is that for many reasons, there are leaders who toil in the vineyards quietly, who make significant and lasting change, and we should recognize and appreciate them which is a perfect segue to the next portion of my talk, which introduces you to a few quiet leaders. I know that we're past Women's History Month, but we're close enough. And this is consistent with the goal of my assignment today to inspire. Mind you, these are merely a few sheroes. By the way, it is very clear who does the coding for search engines when one tries to find information about women leaders in science, and especially those who are women of color. So we need you, we need you working for Google. All right. Uh, my first leader I wanna tell you a little bit about is Alexa Irene Kennedy. She's a doctor, she was a pioneer of her time, both for women physicians and African Americans. She is the first African-American woman neurosurgeon in the United States. Note the year 1981, the first. Consistent with the research I have described, Dr. Kennedy said that the greatest challenge she faced in becoming a neurosurgeon was believing it was possible. Even after grad graduating cum laude from Michigan Medical School, she was discouraged from pursuing neurosurgery. She dealt with prejudice throughout her time at the hospital, such as openly being called the equal opportunity package. Nevertheless, she persisted and was accepted as a surgical intern at Yale New Haven Hospital in 1975, breaking another barrier as the first woman and the first African American to be enrolled in the program. At age 36, she became the chief of neurosurgery at Children's Hospital in Michigan, where she cared for young patients facing life-threatening illness, gunshot wounds, and head trauma. She retired after a long career to Florida but she learned there were no pediatric neurosurgeons in the area in which she lived, so she went back to work. And she began to practice at Pensacola Sacred Heart Hospital. She's since retired again, but she continues to advocate for young women to pursue careers in neurosurgery and medicine. She saw something, it bothered her. She did something about it. Her career certainly reflects the attributes of a quiet leader. Dean Chan Grinvald is one of only four Asian American women law deans. There are 199 law schools in the US. Her career is at the intersection of STEM and law. She is an internationally recognized intellectual property law scholar 
whose research focuses on the enforcement of intellectual property and the potential negative impacts of related laws on small businesses and entrepreneurs. Her work has appeared in leading journals. Her most, leading, her most recent work focuses on the intersection of the right to repair and intellectual property law. Now, remember the quote about radical presence? Here is a bit of background on Asians in law from the Portraits of Asians in Law study published last year. Asian Americans comprise almost 5% of lawyers in America and 7% of law school enrollment. Asian Americans are the largest minority group in big law firms, but they have the highest attrition rates and the lowest ratio of partners to associates. Asian Americans comprise 3% of federal judges, 2% of state judges, compared to nearly 6% of the US population. Only three out of four, 94, U.S. attorneys were Asian American, and only four of 2,437, four of 2,437 electric district attorneys nationwide were Asian American. A quiet leader whose radical presence is shaping perceptions of leaders in the law. Ellen Ochoa is a veteran of three NASA space shuttle flight mission, missions. She is the first Hispanic American woman in space and is a co-inventor on three patents for optical systems that uh, help to clarify and capture fine detail imagery, including applications in space and on Earth. She set a milestone when she be another milestone when she became the first Hispanic and second female director of the Johnson Space Center. She says, I didn't really know any role models. And as you've read about scientists or engineers, you hardly ever saw women, certainly not Latinas. So it wasn't something I was thinking about. I definitely ran into some professors who did not see me as somebody who should be pursuing engineering, she said. But I ended up majoring in physics. Why? Because my physics professor talked to me about some of the careers people can have when they study physics. And, they, and he told me he thought I could do well because of my math background. After her 30-year career with NASA and as an engineer, astronaut, director of the Johnson Space Center, she wants the next generation, especially young children of color, to see what she didn't see, a future in science, discovery, and exploration, and she is writing children's books to accomplish that. Bushra Amawala, is the youngest elected Muslim official in the U.S. At 21 years old, uh, she, she was elected at 21 years old when she was elected to the Skokie Board of Education in Illinois. She ran on a platform of transparency, accessibility, and inclusion. She mobilized voters in her hometown and made history all while pursuing her undergraduate degree. She comes from a working class immigrant family. Since assuming office, she's worked to pass a law requiring every public school in the state of Illinois to teach the positive contributions of Muslim Americans in history. And she helped enact land acknowledgments before every Board of Education meeting. Now 25, the ripe old age of 25, she balances her Board of Education responsibilities with her job at Google and her MBA studies at Northwestern. I love her explanation of why she ran. I was running four years ago 
and they really weren't topics that people were talking about. Accessibility, inclusion, access, honesty, and transparency. Everything from our board meetings wasn't recorded or streamed or played, so there was no access. We were able to set that up in my first six months of getting elected to the board. Dr. Annette S. Lee is an astrophysicist, artist, and director of Native Sky Watchers. She identifies as mixed race Lakota. Her tribe is Lakota from the Red Eagle family, and her other indigenous community is Ojibwe. In 2007, she founded Native Sky Watchers as a grassroots effort to revitalize, regrow, and remember indigenous astronomy and connection to the stars. She is a professor of astronomy and physics at St. Cloud University. She's also an artist with an MFA degree who provides, who combines art and science and culture workshops many of which she holds on reservations with young people in Native communities, which she describes as meaningful work, radical presence. I love her quote about the problem with higher ed. One of the challenges has been that I am a person who is clearly rooted in art and science and culture. Everyone acknowledges there's a crisis in STEM, and not enough young people are going into a STEM. People think about ways to widen participation, especially for underrepresented students. And this idea of interdisciplinary work has gotten more recognition. Most scholars agree interdisciplinary is a good thing, but the university and the academy work in a silo system, and the silos are very old, very stable, and not moving. Saying that interdisciplinary is good and healthy and needed is completely different than actually making that happen, especially within traditional physics and astronomy research. Now, as I completed my speech, I came across information about some of our own quiet leaders, and I'd like to name them so that you realize on our campus some of the women who have become quiet leaders. In 2001, Carolyn Allen became the first black and first woman to serve as dean of the libraries. In 2006, I became dean, the first black and the first woman, and actually person of color, uh, period, and woman. In 2013, Melissa Harwood Rahm became the first woman to serve as Dean of Students. In 2014, Dean Kim Needy became the first woman to serve as Dean of the Graduate College, and she's a twofer. In 2020, she became the first woman to serve as the Dean of the College of Engineering. In 2015, Linda Kuhn became the first woman to serve as Dean of the Honors College, and in 2023, Kate Mama Chevelli became the first permanent woman dean of the College of Education and Health Professions. Circling back to former Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, the strength of quiet leaders should not be underestimated. They are the people who work quietly to make substantial and impactful change. And as Senator Booker said, I see you. Please continue to lead, to advocate for change of the systems that make it difficult for so many to achieve and realize their potential. Know that the beneficiaries of your leadership very much appreciate every prayer, phone call, coffee, nomination, recommendation, shout out, Atta Girls, and your presence. And most of all, thank you for who you are and what you do and for patiently allowing me to share my thoughts with you.
Am I questions? Am I supposed to take questions or no? Okay, I think people want to eat. <laughs> yes. And I did get a mic. Oh, do you need a mic? And I'm sorry for not being clear about that. And I had to think through it. I think that public leaders can engage in quiet leadership. So like when Jacinda went to hug people, that was not performative. She wasn't on a stage. That was just quiet leadership in those, even though she's a public person. And I think all public leaders have times when they engage in that kind of quiet leadership. You see, uh, after a tornado, you might see uh, a president or a cabinet member go to a town and sit with family. So that's a public person, but they're engaging in that quiet leadership. And that's how I sort of sorted that out to me. So, so by, by making that point, I wanted to emphasize the fact that it's not an either or. Um, but there is a role for quiet leadership, and it, a lot of it doesn't get recognized. Thank you for the amazing talk. You've had a lot of time to evolve as a leader and think about quiet leadership. If you could go back in time, what would you tell your younger self about being a leader? That's a really good question, Dinidi. I would say believe in yourself. Um, I received comments like, uh, she cannot manage a dog kennel, much less a law school. Um, I was younger than a lot of the people I was promoted over. Um, I, I'd not been an administrator. And there was so much self-doubt and fear and worry. Um, and I would just go back and say, girl, you got this. You can do it. You know, it's, it's exactly that piece. And that's why I did put that in my speech about confidence. Uh, it really makes a difference, I think. Um, the other thing I guess I would say is that you, you may not be great at everything, right? You, and. I felt the first time, because of the significance of the appointment, 
I walked into the building every day and I felt like I carried Central High on my shoulders and the six pioneers. Why? Because I never wanted anybody to say, oh, we tried one of those and it didn't work out. And I would release myself if I could, I don't know, that's pretty deeply ingrained, but at least to the extent to give myself some grace on that. Um, so it, it just, it was like walking in always constantly with this pressure, both the self-doubt and wanting to be excellent so that you didn't let anybody down. And I would just say to relax about that. Now I can sleep, then I couldn't. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know why I have this pen. Yes, ma'am. Ah. So this is going to go way back, Anna, because you know how old I am. But uh, as a child, I had an aunt who was a domestic. And she, the first thing she did that was amazing was she sold her house on the south side of Chicago and she moved to Watoma, Wisconsin. And needless to say, there was nobody else around like her. Uh, and she had to find her way in that community and she became well accepted. But she taught a lot of, um, really subtle skills. So for example, we often would go with her to clean house, like all work has dignity. And if you, she would say, and, and a lot of the people we work for thought it was, well, that's kind of cute that your niece or nephew, and she would say, now go up to that person, look them in the eye and tell them what your rate is. And if you didn't get paid the right money, you had to go back and tell them that was not my rate. <laughs> so that was a lot as a kid. Uh, she taught us how to work hard. In fact, uh, one of my favorite stories about her is we um, would go to keep us from getting in trouble on the South Side of Chicago in the summer. We would be taken to her farm and dropped off and we used to call it slave labor. Because, you know, if you're a city kid and you have to pick beans and shug beans and clean a chicken coop and pick tomatoes, it was like a whole thing. And so one day we got really kind of fed up with it and we told her we wanted to call home and that we weren't slaves and we wanted to go home and all that. And so she packed us up in her Brambler station wagon and took us down the uh, road to a, at that time they called them pickle farms but I call it a cucumber farm. And if anybody has ever picked cucumbers, they're very itchy, they, yeah. So she took us to this pickle farm and she dropped us off. And um, the family that was there, there were um, Latinx workers, oh, sorry, there were Hispanic workers uh, working in the fields and um, we worked with them side by side and then we came into a trailer with the family and we had peanut butter and tortillas and water for lunch. And we worked until the sun went down and she came to get us. I am 64. At that time, I might've been nine years old and that is a lesson I never forgot. Yeah, so she was pretty, pretty influential. Thank you, Dean Nance, for a wonderful uh, talk. Really appreciate it. Um, you have been nominated and received a lot of awards. <laughs> a lot of awards. And my question is for your leadership, which, as you mentioned, can be quite diverse. It can be quiet, but not always. No. Right. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, Dean Nance, I would like to know which of those recognitions or awards are uh, the most significant for you and why? Well, that's a hard one mm. because uh, the most recent ones are significant in different ways. I'm gonna say being recognized by the federal judiciary 
was pretty amazing. Um, they have an award, a Lifetime Achievement Award, and not many academics get that. And I, my feeling about receiving that was part of it was for the courage um, in engaging in the evaluation of judicial nominees, which was very difficult. Um, and to stand in front of the Eighth Circuit, all the judges, and be recognized, that's pretty hard to beat. Like I, I loved being recognized by the ABA, you know, because those are my friends and colleagues and I love being recognized in our academy, but boy, when a judge gives you an award, that's, that's about as good as it gets. <laughs> so that, I'd, I'd have to say that was, that was pretty amazing, yeah. I think we have time for one more. Yes, sir. Oh, well, that's a good question. So I would say um, to find the find your tribe. By that I mean, um, so for example, for me when I got here, I have a blue collar background and um, my dad was a teamster, my brother was a carpenter, my brother was an electrician, so I came from a labor background. So I found my labor peeps and I found out what was going on with people in the workplace and I wanted to talk about that, right? Cause that was like insight, you know, that really made a difference. So what animates you? What what is it that, hey, that's not fair, you know? Hey, that's not right. Always, when people are trying new leadership skills, it's always best to start with things that are low stakes first, just so that you start to build that confidence that we talked about. Is it a letter to the editor? Is it showing up at a rally? Is it now speaking at the rally? Is it organizing the rally, right? So there are a lot of ways to do that, but use definitely hone in on what it is that really fires you up and then find that tribe to help you engage in that and to move forward. Sometimes you can do it by yourself, sometimes it's better, but the thing about finding your tribe is they encourage you, right? And so those are folks that you can bend their ear, you can get their experience, so that's what I'd say. And I mean, boy, we have organizations mammy on campus and in Fayetteville, so there should be a way to find that group that really energizes you, yeah. It's a, a perfect note uh, to end on. So before we go and have some food together, let's uh, thank Dean Nance one more time for her amazing leadership. <laughs> <laughs>